Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone. In this video we are going to be looking at questionnaire design. So in terms of the questions in our questionnaire or our survey, there are two particular aspects that we want to think about. The first one is what are we going to ask in our questionnaire? And the second is how do we go about doing it? And so we're going to talk a little bit about what, but a lot of the focus of this video is going to be on the how do we ask questions, or I guess in the case of some slides, more of how do we not ask our questions. So what we want to think about when we are writing our questionnaire is our research questions. So remember we start with our broad problem. From our broad problem we come up with some research questions and perhaps some hypotheses. From those what we want to do is we want to say well what do we need to actually find out? What data do we need in order to answer our research questions? So we need to ensure when we are writing our questionnaire that we have all of the necessary questions in order to be answer our research questions. And this is really, really important. You're only going to get one chance to administer your survey or questionnaire. So if you've left a question out, and sometimes it can even just be a little one, uh, if you've left it out, it's too late. You need to make sure that you have your questionnaire perfect because you're only going to get one shot at collecting your data. Uh, there's been cases um, through the years where market research firms have gone out and administered surveys and they have at times forgotten to ask a question that was important. There was one case in New Zealand where a research firm was doing some surveying. They had a very big client, they had a very, very big contract. They have been paid a lot of money. And the question they left out, uh, they were doing phone surveys, on face value doesn't seem very important. The question that they left out was how many people live in your household? The reason this was so important though was that you can imagine if you're doing a phone survey, if you ring a house and there's only one person that lives there, the chance that that person was the one that was selected is 100%. That's the only person you could be talking to. If you ring a house and 10 people live there, there's only 1 in 10 chance that, this, that the particular person you're talking to and interviewing was selected. And when it comes to analysing surveys, uh, being able to have everyone in your sample having equal chances of being selected is quite important. So when this got found out, it meant that all of the data that the company had collected was actually useless. They weren't going to, it wasn't going to be accepted because it wasn't able to be analysed correctly. So I really want to emphasise that proofreading, checking, double checking your questionnaire, uh, ideally having a little pilot study, so testing it out on some people before you do your real study is very, very important because once you've sent out your questionnaires or you've used your phone call centre to ring people and administer, you're not going to be able to easily collect more data. So we need to make sure we get it right. So the first thing is checking. Do we have all the data we need in order to answer our research questions? Beyond that, we also need to think about going through our survey question by question, being quite critical and going, okay, what is the purpose of this question? You may have some questions where you're establishing some sort of rapport with the people that are answering your questions. So you might start out with a few simple questions. They're not necessarily super important for your research questions, but they help people get into, uh, get into the flow of completing your questionnaire. You need to make sure you've got all the demographic variables that you need. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got any behaviours, any attitudes, everything you need to collect. On the other hand though, you don't want to make the survey too long. I can remember seeing one survey and it was a health survey and it had had numerous people involved with creating it. It ended up having 427 questions and they were going to be administering it to school children. And so that many questions, then you run into the problem that people aren't completing it. It's just too long and too hard. People give up. Um, they 
uh, you're not going to get good data because it's just overwhelming for people. So while you need to make sure that you ask, ask every question that you need, you also need to make sure that you're not asking unnecessary questions as well. Our first consideration when we are going to be asking questions is thinking about the participants knowledge. So we need to think about what they can and they cannot answer. So we need to remember that people are going to have trouble recalling things and the further back the time frame the less accurate they're going to be. So we might be able to ask them about what happened in the last week but if we start asking about what happened in the last month uh, then the accuracy is going to decrease and if we're going to ask about the last the last year then it's going to be even worse still. We want to make sure that we don't ask for uninformed opinion so we want to try and be asking objective factual questions. Uh, if we're asking about behaviors we're asking about what they did. We can ask about what they think and what they feel uh, but we don't want opinions in place of fact. So if we were interested in people's diet, we could ask them about what they eat. We could ask them about how they feel about what they eat. But we wouldn't want to ask them what is um, what is the optimal things to be eating because if they're not nutritionists uh, or dietitians, then they may have an opinion but it's unlikely to be particularly informed. So we do need to be careful about asking about things where people have an opinion but it's not actually an educated one. We generally don't want to ask people what they think other people are doing because they are unlikely to know uh, and what they do answer is very likely to be biased. If we asked people about what they think other people eat or how other people exercise or what other people do, uh, they are probably not going to know and if they do decide to hazard a guess it's likely to be pretty incorrect. Another thing we want to be careful of is not asking questions in a way that highlights someone's lack of knowledge. Uh, what happens then is people tend to make stuff up. People don't like to feel stupid, uh, they don't like to feel like they're being judged for not knowing something, so oftentimes they will make stuff up to try and cover for that. There was one study uh, where the researchers uh, created statements from imaginary companies and they asked people what they thought about these imaginary companies and a lot of people had opinions about these companies despite the fact that they were all made up just because they didn't want to be seen to not know about these companies. We need to be careful about our balance of closed and open questions. So a closed question is going to give us quantitative data. So it might be where we were asking someone for a number or it might be multiple choice where they're asking for a category. All of our multi-item scales are effectively closed questions. We're asking people for um, rankings or strongly agree, strongly disagree figures. Nice thing with these questions is there's a lot more analysis that we can do about them. So we will be able to calculate percentages and calculate means and do analysis and do comparisons. Uh, it will limit how many different options people can provide. The downside is that we might miss some detail. So we do want to consider having some qualitative or open questions where there's just boxes and people can type things in because those questions we will get a lot more, potentially more detail does depend on how much people have to say and how knowledgeable they are about what you are asking them uh, as to quite how much they write, uh, particularly when you are doing market research with incentive-based surveys where someone's getting a voucher or some money for doing the survey. Uh, you can get some pretty minimalist efforts on the open-ended questions uh, because the person is quite happy to kind of point and click at answers, but if they have to think and fill it out it's uh, a bit more effort for them uh, so normally we need to to weigh up how many closed and how many open questions 
the open questions are a lot harder and a lot more time consuming us for, for us to analyze because we can't just have means and percentages and things like that. We've got to look for themes. We're going to have to read through more material uh, to come up with our findings. We need to consider when it is appropriate to have a free answer question versus a multiple choice question as well. If we're asking someone their age, then leaving a box and getting them to type in the number of years uh, seems pretty reasonable. But if we're asking for occupation, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to have any meaningful analysis if people can just type into the box whatever they like. Really nice thing with web surveys, uh, particularly for questions like that, what is your age question, is we can have some accuracy checking as we go. So if we have an age question, we might tell our web survey that if someone enters more than 99 or 105, or we can pick some particular point, then we can prompt them. And we can say, well, actually, you entered 345, and we don't think this is your age. And odds on they've made a typo. They meant to type in 34 or 45, uh, and they just happened to hit three keys instead of two keys. So multiple choice is going to be uh, useful for a lot of the questions that we want to ask because it's going to give us the best kind of data for us to be able to analyze. We wouldn't necessarily use it exclusively, uh, but certainly a lot of a lot of the kinds of questions we want to ask um, will allow us to do quantitative analysis. Uh, it'll make it specific enough that our respondents will be able to answer and it'll fit nicely into web surveys where they can all be set up as point and click. So I have an example here, what is your occupation? And this is a pretty poor example because there's just not enough categories. When we're writing our multiple choice questions, we need to ensure that we have a sufficient spread of categories that we get some meaningful results. It would be also not very good if maybe we had 30 or 40 different occupations listed there because it would just take people too long to scroll through them. But having only four is not particularly informative at all. And we would imagine a lot of people would be ticking that other box. So when we're writing multiple choice, we need to make sure all of the common uh, possibilities are covered, but we're not collapsing down into so few categories that we don't that we miss out on getting meaningful data. Whenever we can have some sort of objective measurement, we want that ahead of a subjective one, particularly when we're looking at behaviors. If we are looking at behaviors, we normally either want to say something along the lines of perhaps in the last week, what did you do? So we're, we're trying to get some recall on what someone did in the previous week. Or alternatively, we might ask about something like in a typical week or in a typical month or on average. Um, and we'll get someone to describe what they consider their typical behavior to be. So you can see here, uh, we've got two different possibilities for asking about shopping at a shopping center. And the one on the left, occasionally, sometimes, and often, are very subjective terms. They'll mean different things to different people. Uh, whereas when we start associate, associating numbers, so never, one time, two time, three time, four time, um, that's, that's objective, that's, that's an actual measurement of the behavior. So when we can, we always want to have a measurement of a behavior rather than an ambiguous term. So as I mentioned before, we should always make sure we cover all the possibilities. So you can see with this first question about going to the gym last week, there's no options there for zero or one or two or seven. So we need to make sure we cover all the possibilities. Uh, but we also though want to make sure that we don't collapse categories down. So zero to seven as a single category is not particularly meaningful at all. We would definitely want to split that out into what we thought the uh, most common groupings would be. When we're wording our questions, we want to be very clear. We want to use simple grammar. We want to be as brief as possible. We don't want people reading any more than they need to because the more they need to read 
a question, the more likely they are to get confused or forget or to misinterpret. Uh, we need to keep in mind the vocabulary and the English skills of our respondents. I read one guide where it said you should generally, if you're writing questionnaires for the general public, you should generally aim for a skill level of about an 8 to 10 year old. Otherwise, it's going to be too tricky for some people. For some populations, you might be able to use slightly more complex vocabulary. So, say you were surveying university students or university lecturers, uh, you might decide that they can cope with slightly higher level of vocabulary. Uh, but we want to phrase things as simply as possible. We always want to avoid double negatives, so we don't want to have a don't and a not together, because that's going to confuse people. We want to try and avoid technical terms and abbreviations as much as we possibly can. If they are absolutely necessary, then we should make sure that they are very clearly defined so the person knows exactly what we're talking about. I've seen some web surveys that deal with this by actually having little uh, pop-ups so you can put the cursor over an abbreviation or over a technical term and it will actually have, give you a little box which gives the definition every time it's mentioned. So it's quite a good way of going about it with the web surveys. Some of the things we want to watch out for uh, in order to avoid, bi avoid bias. Uh, so one is mentioning specific examples when we're not interested in specific examples. So for instance, if I said, did you purchase fast food such as McDonald's? Uh, the person might just think only about McDonald's or focus on McDonald's. In fact, when we ask further questions about fast food, we've already got them thinking about McDonald's and that's possibly not what we want to do. Uh, this can also be a problem with open-ended and qualitative uh, questions as well. I can remember seeing a survey a few years ago where they it was a student so a survey of students and they were getting asked uh, what what parts of maths they have difficulty with and the person that had written it put for example and listed a couple of things I think they said something like for example trigonometry and calculus and algebra and nearly everyone that answered that question wrote trigonometry and calculus and algebra so it ended up not being very meaningful because all that was happening is the examples were getting regurgitated back. We want to avoid emotional language um, and when you are looking at and evaluating other people's surveys that's something to watch out for is if you see emotional language or if you see leading questions or so leading question is one where the person is trying to lead you to a particular answer or if you see unbalanced response categories like the one at the one at the bottom there um, where you're asked about the mayor and they're outstanding or excellent or very good or at worst they're satisfactory then you normally get a pretty good impression of what the researcher is trying to find out so all of those three things when you see them in a survey that normally indicates that the person's not really interested in ca uh, finding genuine information. They don't actually want to know what people think. They just want to have some data to back up that maybe the mayor is doing a great job or their company is excellent or something along the lines of that. I did a training session uh, a few few months ago and I was, wasn't doing the training. I was one of the participants and all of the participants at the end got a, a little satisfaction survey on how much they liked it and categories look very similar to the ones at the bottom there so it was all about how much you liked your training and in fact the training was pretty awful but you didn't get any chance anywhere in the survey to say that you could only say how amazing it was so it does can lead you to be a little bit cynical but it can also give you a very good picture about the researcher and what what they are actually trying to do with their survey when you're writing your, your surveys, you shouldn't be doing any of this. You should be being objective, trying to find out information. If you think back to our uh, one of our early videos when we were talking about ethics, um, one of the key parts of ethics around data is that you are uh, uh, finding and then reporting the actual data. You're not, you're not trying to spin it in a particular way. So... When we lay out our questionnaire, 
Uh, there's normally a, a fairly logical organization to it. We always would start with an introduction where you are identifying who you are and who your company is or who is sponsoring or paying for the study. You then describe the purpose of the survey. So what is it that you're trying to find out? Uh, you then invite the person to participate. So this ties back to the ethics and the, the voluntary participation. And then you would also provide instructions. And amongst the request for participation, you'd also give an indication of if it's a survey, how long it is, or anything else that the person may be uh, committing to if they're going to be a research participant. So it could be that it's a survey and a follow-up interview, or a survey and you might request them to be in a focus group, or anything else that they may be involved with. Once we've given some response instructions, then we will normally open up with uh, either some screening questions uh, and or, uh, also some warm-up questions. So the screening questions help us to check whether or not the person is actually someone we want to survey. And it can also be demographic questions that we use for a particular sampling method called stratified sampling that we'll learn about later in the study period. So if we were interested in only surveying people that own an iPad, our very first screening question would probably be something like, do you own an iPad? If the person says no, then we can thank them and that's the end of their survey. So the screening questions help ensure that we are surveying the people that we want to survey. We'll normally start with uh, fairly simple questions that are um, not too uh, confronting or intrusive and are quite easy for people to answer. Um, it may be behavioural questions, it may be just fairly general questions about the product or about whatever it is that we are going to be asking about, just to get them into the flow of answering questions and thinking about the topic. So we start with fairly basic ones and as the survey goes on uh, we will start to get the slightly more complex questions and scales and things like that. So the midsection uh, we might have some sort of organization by topic, uh, we might decide to have questions about a similar area together, uh, we might have all of our scales together. As we go from section to section we might have some sort of transition so might be separate web pages, a little introduction saying now I'm going to ask you questions about this, now I'm going to ask you questions about something else. And we will build up to the more demanding questions uh, if we're asking about things like psychological well-being or drug taking or sexual health or things that people are maybe less likely to answer. We will probably kind of get them, get them answering more simple things first uh, before we get to the slightly more confronting ones. And particularly when we are asking very confronting questions, uh, we may have a little warning beforehand uh, and we may have information, suppose we're asking about depression and anxiety and things like that, uh, we might remind people uh, about where they can seek help uh, either before or after we're asking those kind of questions. So particularly those of you that are doing psychology, that can be quite relevant. We'll normally conclude with demographics. Uh, we may have asked some demographics amongst our screening questions for the purpose of sampling, uh, but we'll normally leave the demographics to the end uh, just because they're pretty straightforward. People know how old they are and hopefully what gender they are and where they live and things like that. Uh, so we'll normally leave those to the end once we've got the, the key topic-based information. Uh, something that I think is very important is uh, with any kind of surveying and interviewing is um, to show some genuine appreciation. This person's uh, taken some time to give you some data, uh, so in ending with some sort of thank you. So normally, just kind of a summary of of that kind of order of questions. Uh, we want to try and have some sort of logical order. We don't want to be jumping back and forth between different topics, different kinds of questions. Uh, we will normally be moving from the, uh, the more general and the more impersonal to the more specific and personal questions. Uh, 
sometimes some questions will lead into others to give context but we do need to be a little bit careful about uh, some questions influencing the answers to others so just like before where I was saying that there was the question where the students had to say what parts of math they found hard and they just listed the examples uh, if you had somewhere earlier in the questionnaire been uh, talking about particular branches of maths and then you gave them an open box uh, you might find that that had quite a strong influence on what they wrote into that box okay so one final thought and this is this is very very important is to consider our format and our layout so we want to ensure that our survey is professionally presented if it's not professionally presented if it's on kind of some some ratty looking paper and it's got spelling mistakes and grammatical issues and bits falling off the page it's unlikely people are going to want to complete your survey uh, and they're certainly not going to take it seriously so presentation counts for a lot you need to ensure that you have correct spelling and correct grammar if you're doing a paper-based survey then normally uh, you can have one or two-sided um, I've certainly seen a number of people recommend recommending single-sided paper uh, just from the point of view that sometimes you get people that don't spot the questions on the backs of the pages and so if you have someone that's only answering the fronts of the pages and not the back then that's not going to be very helpful for you uh, if we're looking at web pages we also need to be really careful about the layout we don't want to have too many questions on a page because it'll overwhelm people but we also don't want to have too many separate pages if you answer some questions and you see at the bottom that you've completed page 1 out of 88 then you're probably going to think well I don't have have the time or patience to answer 88 pages worth of questions and um, so it'll be much more likely for people to give up so with web surveys we need to find a balance of not too many pages but also not too many uh, questions per page I think one of the very worst uh, examples of web survey that I've ever seen uh, was quite a few years ago. It was when web surveys had very first started and they hadn't really figured them out very well. And so it was one of the first ones. And it was looking at internet banking, which was also pretty new. And the surveying company had put all of the questions on a single web page. And there were 65 questions about internet banking. If you completed the survey, you got a $5 uh, shopping voucher for a shop in New Zealand called The Warehouse. And that might not sound like very much. Um, probably at the time it was a little bit more notable than it is now, but you got a $5 voucher. So there was an incentive for completing the survey. And so question one of the survey said, do you use internet banking, yes or no? and next to yes and no it actually told you where in the survey it was going to go next so if you said yes I do internet banking you went to question 2 if you said no I don't use internet banking you went to question 65 so if you went to question 65 then you entered your details and you got your shopping voucher funnily enough that particular year according to that survey no one in New Zealand used internet banking so it's quite an extreme example, but it shows you how just silly little things can have a very big impact on the quality of your data. So you want to be as concise as possible. You need to make sure you have sufficient instructions. If people don't understand how to answer a question, whether they can tick multiple boxes, whether they have to answer every line, things like that, then it's going to impact on the quality of your data. You want to have appealing layout when you are constructing a survey uh, say in word you need to be really careful of your horizontal and your vertical space if you list all of your multiple choice uh, just down the left hand side and you have a big uh, big lot of white space on the right hand side of your page so you're not using your horizontal space well firstly your survey is not going to look very good secondly it's going to look like it's really long it's going to go on for pages and pages um, just because you're not making good use of your space you should use very clear fonts and you should be consistent with your fonts throughout your survey so it should be nice clear professional looking fonts so no comic sans no pink letters 
um, and you should make sure you're consistent throughout. Uh, quite often it's quite useful to have section headings. So the section headings will help to indicate uh, where there's different new and different types of questions or different uh, topics through the survey. Okay, so hopefully this has been a helpful video for looking at some of the aspects of uh, writing a questionnaire. Uh, it's certainly, there is a lot of science and a fair bit of art to it as well, both in terms of presentation, laying it out, uh, the way that you go about asking questions. Ultimately you want to have a survey that does as good a job as possible of getting accurate information and of having people complete, so start it, work all the way through, not give up part way through and complete it, uh, whilst understanding all the questions and answering them accurately. Uh, there's also a good degree of common sense, uh, so when you've, when you've written questions, when you're looking at your survey, always look at it with a critical eye, but also kind of apply that common sense check. Is this, is this actually sensible? Is this making sense? Have I got the right categories? And things like that. This has been a Swinburne production.